Welcome to The Place We Find Ourselves, the podcast where we not only talk about all things related to story, trauma, and therapy, but also have the privilege of hearing some of the sacred real-life stories of interview guests. I'm Adam Young, and this is the very first episode of The Place We Find Ourselves. Today I talk about what it means that you have a story. And more specifically, we'll get into why this story, the story of your life, may matter more than you think it does. Let me begin with two very simple claims. Number one, you've got a story and that story matters. And number two, the only way to experience significant shifts in your heart is by engaging your story. Uh, by addressing it, by looking at it, by reflecting upon it. That's the only way to experience really substantive, significant shifts in your heart. Now, what do I mean by story? Well, a, a story has certain characteristics. All stories have setting. They have plot. There are plot twists. There are characters. There are themes. Have you ever thought about your life as an epic story? Epic stories have tons of different settings. They cross decades, just like your life. Think of all the different settings in your life. The hospital room when you were delivered, when you first came into the world. That's a setting, part of the story of your life. Your kindergarten class. The first soccer team you played on. Your piano recital when you were 10 years old. Junior prom. The day that that really bad thing happened in your family that nobody ever talks about. These are all settings, and the story of your life has many, many uh, different settings. And then, then there are all the characters that make an appearance in the epic story that is your life. Your parents, siblings, grandparents, uncles and aunts. There are the characters of your teachers, your second grade teacher, your basketball coach, piano instructor, the neighbor kids who live down the street from you. And if you move to a new place when you were a kid, a whole new cast of characters comes into play. Who are the important characters in the story that is your life? Who are the characters that entered your story for a short season, but perhaps they played an important role? Did you have a teacher who, for some reason, took a liking to you? and encouraged you and invited you to step into more of who you are, who you were as a boy or as a girl? Did you have a teacher who, for whatever reason, didn't like you and made that clear? These people marked you because they are characters in your life story. And next there's plot. The story of your life has an inordinate number of subplots. Think of them all. There's the plot line of your relationship with your father. What are the pivotal moments in your relationship with your father? What moments marked the dynamics that would become part of, of every day relating with your father? Uh, what were the moments that marked shifts in your relationship with him? Perhaps uh, it could be as short as a 30-second interaction, but your relationship with your father changed that day. There are moments uh, that are se seemingly frozen in time that we remember. I remember when I was playing soccer as a third grader, and my dad would sometimes come to my games, but he wouldn't stand with the other parents. He stood down at the top of the opposing team's penalty box, and whenever I got the ball and he'd yell something, it was like everything else went silent, and all I could hear was his voice. What about your mom? If you were to storyboard your relationship with your mom, if you were to give one scene for each year of your life, for example, what would the scenes be? What are the scenes, the, the moments, the interactions with your mother that proved to be significant in how you came to view yourself, to view relationships, to view your world? If you have siblings, there is the plotline of your relationship with each of your siblings. 
and how that relationship changed over the course of time. Whether you were the older sibling or the younger sibling, these relationships, these dynamics uh, became trajectories uh, that launched you into the world. And then there's the plot line of your relationship with God. The core story of every man's heart, every woman's heart, is the story of how they have interacted with God with regard to their desires and their disappointments. So when you look at your story, when you look at how you related and have related to God over the years, what have you done with God in the midst of moments where desires uh, raged and were either met or unmet? If you were to draw a timeline of your relationship with God and everything above the x-axis was good moments with God and everything below the x-axis is uh, bad seasons, months, years with God, what would your timeline look like? How would you graphically represent uh, the plot line of your relationship with God? When you experience deep disappointment in your life, how did that influence your relationship with God? All plot lines that become meaningful to us have twists to them. I hope your story has a number of plot twists because all great stories do. By plot twist, I mean that you're headed in a particular direction and you have energy toward that end. And then, bam, something happens and your trajectory is suddenly changed. All plot twists result in some measure of disorientation. You're going along life with a particular understanding of how the world works, and then all of a sudden something intrudes and something disorients you. And the ground that you thought was solid under your feet, your understanding of how the world operated, or perhaps how God operated, or perhaps how your family operated, all of a sudden, that ground becomes very, very shaken, shaky, if not upturned completely. And it is in seasons of disorientation that we find out what we actually desire and what we're truly made of. So your life story is far more epic than The Lord of the Rings, for example. There are more settings. There are more characters. There is a thicker plot. You may not see it yet, uh, but it's there. What if you took the story of your life seriously? What if you began to be curious about how it has unfolded and how you and God are co-authoring this epic story that is your life? Now, another way of answering the question, what do I mean by your story, is... Uh, very different than the one I just outlined, and we could put it in the word, it's it's neurobiologically. There, there is a neurobiological way of understanding this word story, and all I mean by this is you have billions of neurons in your brain, and each of those neurons is connected to thousands of other neurons. Now, there are only two ways that those neural connections develop, genes and life experiences genes and life experiences. So when I speak of your story, I mean your life experiences, which simply means your brain. So when we say story, what we're really talking about is the particular ways that the neurons in your brain are wired and connected with one another. With the exception of the genes that were passed on to you, your brain is a function entirely of the experiences you have had in life. That, that is a profound uh, confession, sentence, discovery. So why do I say that you are not going to experience meaningful heart-level change until you engage your story? Because change means that neurons link up differently with one another. You are not going to change deeply until you engage your neurons which means until you engage the experiences you have had in life. Now, when it comes to engaging your story, 
there's a sense in which the most significant plot line of that story is your relationship with your parents. It's certainly the most influential in terms of setting the trajectory for your life. Why is this the case? Well, it's actually a matter of science. There are there are two scientific principles. Just like there's the first and second law of thermodynamics, there is what could be called the first and second law of neurobiology. And here's law number one. Relationships influence the brain more than anything else. More than exercise, more than drugs, more than nutrition, more than meditation, more than religious experience, more than anything. Relationships with other people influence the brain, influence the way your neurons are connected to one another more than any other single factor. And law number two, your earliest life experiences have a much more significant influence on the development of your brain than your later life experiences. The brain grows at a very rapid speed for the first couple years of your life, and then it slows way down. When you put those two laws together, you get the following implication. Your earliest relationship with your primary caretakers has had the most shaping power on your brain. So law number one, relationships influence the brain more than anything else. Law number two, your earliest life experiences influence the brain more than later life experiences. Put those together and the, and the conclusion is as follows. Your earliest relationships with your primary caretakers has affected, influenced, shaped your brain more than anything else. Now, Here's the obvious dilemma. <laughs> you don't remember anything about the first couple years of your life. You have no idea how your parents related to you when you were 18 months old. That's actually not true. You have no explicit memory of the first couple years of your life, but your implicit memory remembers all of it. Now, more on that later, but let me add a simple sentence now. You know how your parents interacted with you when you know how your parents interacted with you when you were little because you remember how they interacted with you in elementary school, in high school, uh, today as an adult. And you can look backwards and you can infer backwards based on your, your, your deep knowledge of the look and the feel of these relationships. You know the dynamics of your relationship with your mother. You know the dynamics of your relationship with your father. You know this man and this woman uh, very, very well. You know how they operate. You know how they have related to you. You know how they have related to each other and to their siblings. You were immersed in it. And therefore, you can infer how it might have been for you when you were six months old and in a crib. Given what you know about your mother, what do you think it was like for her when you were crying in your crib as a six-month-old and she didn't know how to console you? You have no explicit memory of that. You have a hundred percent implicit memory of that, and I'll explain more about that another time. But merely to say this, you can infer, you can deduce based on what you know of your mother now and during your growing up years, how it might have been for you when your brain was growing at its most rapid rate in the first two years of your life. Now, I want to shift gears for a minute and talk about common objections to diving into our story. Number one, looking at your story, reflecting on your story is basically just introspective navel gazing. Uh, this can actually be relatively easily dispensed with. And, and here's how. Neuroscience over the past decade has shown that people who know themselves, people who have a heightened capacity for 
and commitment to self-reflection have much more empathy than others. And so engaging your story is in no way a selfish endeavor. In fact, what neuroscience has shown is that you cannot engage well with others. You cannot love others well. You cannot empathize with other people well until you have addressed the wounded parts in your heart as a result of your story. People with a high capacity for and practice of self-reflection, reflecting on how they are in the world and how they have come to be who they are in the world, these people have a increased ability to empathize with others. So in other words, if you want to love other people well, if you want to be other-centered, you need to practice reflecting on your story, which is to say your brain, your heart. Objection number two, I don't want to blame my parents. I don't want to blame my parents. There's a difference between blaming someone and naming what has been true of your relationship with them. There's a difference between blaming someone, which is a posture of contempt and condemnation, and naming what has been true of your relationship with them, which doesn't need to have any contempt whatsoever. So nine out of 10 times when someone says to me, I, I don't want to blame my parents, my initial thought is, is, is almost always this. You know, there's nothing about your posture right now whatsoever that is blaming, that is condemning, that is accusatory. In fact, you couldn't be further from a posture of blame. The past 30 minutes, you've been working very hard to defend them. <laughs> so how is it that you have gone from defending them to all of a sudden becoming concerned that you might be blaming them? Blame is about a posture of contempt towards another person. It's a posture of accusation. You know what it's like when, when someone is blaming you for something. And you know what it's like when someone is naming something that is true of you uh, without a posture of accusation or contempt. So it is very possible. And indeed, I would say, if you want to love your parents well, it is necessary for you to begin with naming what has been and is true of the nature of how you relate to your parents and how your parents relate to you. And that endeavor is in no way synonymous with blaming them for anything. Objection number three, my parents did the best they could. Here's what's fascinating about this objection. I hear it most often from Christian clients. I, I actually understand this objection when it's made by people who aren't Christian. <laughs> I, I mean, I understand it more, but it is such an odd objection for Christians to make because according to the Bible, no one does the best they can. Everyone's a sinner and sin is not abstract. It's always particular. In other words, you're parents have harmed you, that harm has been intentional, and it doesn't make them an awful person, it just makes them a sinner. So if you're a Christian, the notion that your parents did the best they could, oh boy, that's an odd conviction for a Christian to hold. So why do we tend to raise the objection my parents did the best they could. This is what I think is going on for most of us. We want to say they did their best because that way we don't have to look at the reality of the sin in their hearts. And more accurately, we don't have to look at how deeply they hurt us. But if it's the truth that sets us free, we gain nothing by out of loyalty to our parents, closing our eyes to what has been true of our relationship with them. So if every person is a sinner, have you named the primary ways that your mother sinned against you? 
have you put language to the primary ways, some of the core ways, the common ways, the frequent ways in which your mother harmed you? And what about your father? Have you named, have you written down the primary ways that your father sinned against you? As a father myself, I've learned that next to my wife, the people I sin against the most are my children. And I could write down uh, and share with great particularity uh, very specific ways that I have not only harmed my children, uh, but intentionally done so. You have been deeply affected by your parents' sin. Wouldn't it be helpful to name the particular ways that that has been true for you? You know, in Genesis chapter 50, really the last 13 chapters of Genesis, we have the story of a man named Joseph and a family uh, that is deeply dysfunctional, and uh, the siblings and the father and the mother uh, who have harmed Joseph. And it's really a story of Joseph naming the harm that has been done to him by his family members. And if you don't know the story, I invite you to go and read it. But the trajectory of the story is towards Joseph finally naming the ways that his, in the case of this story, his brothers have sinned against him, have harmed him. And if it is okay for him to do that, if we have that narrative in Scripture, isn't it okay for you to do the same? Honesty requires that you name how life really was for you. And since you live in a broken world, honesty, honesty requires that you name how you have been hurt. Have you named how your father hurt you? Have you named how your mother hurt you? Honesty about these things will change your life. It will change your brain. You will never be the same if you start naming the truth of the ways that the most shaping relationships on your heart and mind, how those relationships harmed you. When it comes to experiencing healing, naming how you've been harmed is about 70% of the battle. So, the question really is not, am I excusing my parents? Because you are. All of us do. The question really is, when and where are you excusing them? Because there are, there are ways that you will name how your parents have harmed you. And there are areas that you are very reluctant, even though deep down you know they failed you big time in that particular way. Uh, you are reluctant to name how devastating that was to your heart. What is it that you're not wanting to look at? Now, objection number, I think it is four, goes something like this. My dad was abused as a child. My mom had an awful childhood. When asked to tell our story, most of us do a masterful job minimizing or outright denying the sinfulness of our parents. But when we do acknowledge their failures, the words have barely left our mouths before we launch into a fervent explanation of how our parents really did the best they could. They grew up in bad families or tough economic times or in the midst of a war. And are, are, are these uh, sentences true? Y yes. Uh, abusive families uh, have profound influences on how your parents parented you. Uh, living through difficult uh, economic times profoundly influences how your parents came to parent you. Certainly, if your father or mother served in a war that that is going to, or saw traumatic things that is going to profoundly affect how they parented you but oftentimes we use sentences like you know my father grew up in a, with an alcoholic mother or an alcoholic father we use sentences like that 
to avoid naming and sitting with the ways our Father in turn harmed us. And really, it goes back to this simple, simple claim. Most of us prefer explanations to a Savior. I'd prefer to explain that my parents harmed me in the way they did because they too were harmed. And I would prefer to give explanation for why my mother treated me the way she did, going back to her childhood, et cetera, et cetera. I would prefer to explain that than I would to cry out to God, saying, our family is broken and we need a Savior to heal and to redeem incurable wounds. Incurable wounds. And really, the promise of the scriptures is that God heals incurable wounds. So, the title of this podcast, The Place We Find Ourselves, one place in which we find ourselves is we find ourselves in a world in which you have been harmed. Last objection goes something like this. What's the point of dwelling on the past? What's the point? I mean, you might overcome all of the previous objections. You might realize, you know, reflecting on my story is not selfish, introspective navel-gazing. You you might come to realize, okay, and it's not even blaming my parents. Uh, And you might come to realize that, you know, my parents did not do the best they could. But then you get to this point where you say, okay, I, I understand all that. But look, what's the point? Of dwelling on the past. Now, I will address this in much more depth when we talk about implicit memory. But for now, let me just quote William Faulkner, who, through one of his characters in the novel Requiem for a Nun, says the following brilliant sentence The past isn't dead, it's not even past. The past isn't dead, it's not even past. Now, what's he getting at? I have no idea what he meant when he penned that line, but I can tell you what neuroscience has confirmed about the truthfulness of those eight words. If you think your past is in the past, you don't understand how the brain is built and how the brain functions. This is an oversimplification of how the brain processes present experience, but it's basically like this. Whenever you have an experience in the present, the very first thing your brain does is it filters that experience through all of your past experiences. In other words, no one experiences reality as it truly is in the present. That notion is a fiction based on a misunderstanding of how the brain comes to be formed and how the brain operates throughout life. We experience reality through the lens of what we have already experienced. You see more of what you've already seen. For example, suppose your father was an alcoholic who raged at your mother when he was drunk, and it almost always led to your mother being physically hurt. Decades later, Decades later, when you find yourself in the presence of a man who is both drunk and angry, you are going to be more apt to perceive him harming the women around him, whether he actually is or not. Why? Because you have neurons, and that's how neurons operate. Neurons are connected with one another, and neurons that are wired together, that are connected together, fire together. In other words, your brain has been primed to think that the next thing that happens when an angry drunk man begins to rage at a woman is that the woman gets physically hurt. The reason that the past isn't dead, the reason that it's not even past, is because of this thing called priming. God has designed the brain with neurons so that it anticipates the next thing based on past experience. This is a brilliant mechanism for surviving in a dangerous world. 
Now, let me turn the objection on its head. The point of engaging your past <laughs> is so that you can actually live in the present. Until you engage your past, until you engage your story, you are actually living as much in the past as you are in the present. So what's the point of, quote unquote, dwelling on the past? Well, the point is so that you can live actually in the present. Now that we've examined some of the common objections to engaging your story, let, let's just look at a positive reason to do so. And it's simply this. It, it turns out that the practice of reflecting on the story of your life actually promotes healing in your brain. And there are essentially two reasons for this. N number one, brain health is a function of the degree to which all parts of your brain are connected with one another. And number two, the process of reflecting on your story, of sharing your story with another person, and then hearing their reaction to your story, that process connects neural networks that were previously separated. In other words, the key to healing is connecting. Engaging the core stories of your life heals your brain by connecting regions that were previously not well connected. And there are two broad ways that this is true. One way is connecting left to right. When you experience harm, your thoughts about the experience become disconnected from the overwhelming emotions you had. The neurons that represent your thoughts about the experience, which are stored in your left brain, become disconnected from the neurons representing your feelings about the experience, which are stored in the right brain. And telling the story of the experience, as long as you stay emotionally connected as you tell the story, the act of telling the story requires that your brain link up your thoughts about the story in your left brain with your feelings about the story in your right brain. If you are able to tell your story while remaining connected to your emotions, then the neural networks in the left part of your brain will link up with the neural networks in the right part of your brain, and this is very healing. It leads to what neuroscientists call integration and what the Bible calls shalom, the webbing together of things that are separated into a fabric that is whole. Now, the second way that telling your story uh, leads to connection within your brain is by connecting the top of your brain to the bottom of your brain. Top, in this case, refers to the portion of your brain that is behind your forehead, called your cortical brain. And bottom refers to the portion of your brain that is lower and that is deeper, your limbic brain. The limbic brain is what triggers your fight-flight response or your shutting down response. And when you begin to reflect on the harmful parts of your story, the hard parts of your story, stories that hold shame, fear, or rage, when you begin to tell those stories, your limbic brain reacts and you enter a state of fight-flight or a state of shutting down. Now, do I really have to tell it to another person? You may be wondering. Yes. And, and here's why. If you are able to stay with the story in the presence of another person, two things happen, which are both very good for your brain. First, the other person's limbic brain regulates yours, which is to say their limbic brain soothes and calms yours. Their holding of your story brings containment and grounding to your dysregulated, disoriented limbic brain. And second, as a result of their attunement, as a result of their soothing, your cortical brain, your top, forms connections and linkages with your limbic brain, the bottom. In other words, the presence of an attuned listener leads to changes in your brain's wiring. Neurons that were previously separated become connected.
your brain develops neural pathways that connect your top cortical brain to your bottom limbic brain. And this is very healing because these pathways enable you to self-regulate when you become overwhelmed by fear, shame, or rage. And so in summary, let me repeat the two claims I began with. Number one, you have a story and that story matters. And number two, the only way to experience significant shifts in your heart, in your brain, is by engaging your story. May you find the freedom to begin to step into your story, if not for the first time, then in new ways. It is a very worthwhile endeavor. Before we end, just one more thing. Uh, writing one of the core stories of your life is not an easy thing to do. If you want help with this endeavor, I have put together a short guide on how to write a story. And you can get this guide by going to adamyoungcounseling.com forward slash story. That's adamyoungcounseling.com forward slash story. Thanks so much for listening to The Place We Find Ourselves. Music for this podcast was provided by Rick Wilson. If you would like to subscribe to future episodes, you can go to adamyoungcounseling.com forward slash podcast, and there will be a button to subscribe uh, for future podcast episodes. 